this is the first live stream we're trying from Hayashen, so hopefully everything will go well. And so we are extremely grateful for uh, Kev to be with us today. And also a very big thank you to all of you for coming under very difficult circumstances. As you know, we've had COVID, uh, but we're all coming through that now. And, uh, and also thank you for Zori for filming this, and, and Sipan, and Renetia for helping organize it. And also a big thank you to the BBC Children in Need who are funding part of this. Uh, and we're very grateful for them because uh, they do a lot of good. And Armenian young people have lots of needs. They're all dispersed. They hardly see each other together uh, like this. And so it's an opportunity for us to come together and have a laugh at a, during a very difficult year. Uh, so we're grateful for having one of the best, if not the best, entertainer, Armenian entertainer in the world. Yeah, I don't know who he is. Kev Orkian. That's it. Okay, now, how are you guys? You alright? Everyone alright? Yeah. yeah, cool. Are you all Armenian speakers as well? Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Shut up, shut up. Okay, so I'll do a bit of Armenian, I'll do a bit of English, of course, and, um, and we'll get the ball rolling. Now, before we start, I want to tell you a little bit about myself first, because I think it's important you guys know who I am and I get to know who you are. So, my name is Kevon Kapikian, that's my real name. Uh, and when I got into the entertainment industry, uh, no one could say my name. Uh, has anyone got that problem with their friends or teachers at school not being able to say your name properly? Yeah? Okay. I had that. Great. Yeah. What? Well, what's your name? Uh, David Hagopian. Hagopian. So they, they find it hard to say Hagopian. What do they say? Please tell me what they say. I, I don't even know. They say something like... Hakobian or something. Hakobian. Yeah. yeah. My one was uh, Kapikian, my surname. Uh, Kapikian. Sorry? Kapikian. No, it's not Kapikian, it's Kapikian. Krivok and Kavalk. These are the kind of names I've got, right? So it was always a pain. So I decided to change my name. Okay, and what I did was Kev, Kevon Kapikian, I took the Kapikian of my name. So then it became Kev Orkian. And that's how I came up with the name Kev Orkian, right? So, little did I know, it was related to a, a doctor called Jack Kavorkian. Hello. But, um, so I started building my career uh, as a performer. Do we have any musicians or performers in the audience? Anyone dying to be a performer when you grow up? Don't look at me frightened like that boy. No, anyone? Go on. I play the piano. Amazing. Anyone? Any other musicians? I play the doo doo. The doo doo? Yeah. Amazing. I play the violin. You play the violin. Do we not have more musicians in this room? That's amazing, you know, coming from Armenian backgrounds. I thought your mums would have forced you. My mum forced me. No, she did. My mum was like, we didn't, we didn't have a kiss. We didn't have a kiss. Yeah, yeah, kiss. It's just a passion, you know, it's that kind of thing. So I, I had all that. I mean, I, and I stopped here when I was three and a half, um, you know, playing the piano. So for me, there were, I had no choice. I had to play the piano or I had to get beats. Yeah, it was either one or the other. And, and you know what your mums are like. You know? I mean, actually, no, you don't know what your mums are like because your mums are soft compared to what my mum was, right? Your mum probably don't hear you. Tell, one person put a hand up, so tell me now if your mum's ever beat you. <laughs> don't lie to me. Shut up. Be quiet. Put on the yeah. Your mum's beat you. How old were you when she beat you? Uh, five. Or yeah, well, you deserved it, right? But the thing is, yeah. Yeah, you deserve it. But I, I honestly, my mum was like, my mum, Terkovta, Terkashes, Kesi, Mama? No belt. With the belt? Hey, bravo. Love my mum. Okay, no, not with me. No, not with me. Not with me. See, with me, my mum, oh, love it. You know these big sticks? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the one where she beats you so hard you can't even walk. You like that? You're walking back. No, but that's how my mum was, right, with me. And she's only this high. So, anyway. <laughs> So I got taught to play the piano when I was three and a half years old, and that was insane because for me, I didn't have a choice. But I started learning the piano, and I enjoyed it. And uh, do you enjoy playing the violin? Yeah. Liar. So the thing is, yeah. No, I'm just joking. So the thing is, I started learning, and I started to learn, and, and it became part of my life, right? And as a as a musician. You don't really become a proper musician until you start doing your grades. Do you do grades? Yeah. yeah? Uh, grades? Do, do, do you do grades? You don't do grades. So do you just take it up as a hobby then? Yeah. And can you play it properly? Yeah, I just learn the songs. But you do your own thing with it? Yeah. That's awesome, man. I met uh, Jivan Gasparian, you know, the guy who actually, I met him, he was on my documentary, and, um, and his son, Jivan Gasparian Jr. 
They're awesome guys, but you know what? That is one haunting sound. What, what made you take that up, by the way, if you don't want me asking? Um, I, I had an album with it from like, I can't remember who, but I really like the sound. And, I just wanted to play it and, just... and you just self taught? Um, I have a teacher who teaches like frequently. Right. Like through online, but yeah. Oh my god, do you know what? I'd love to, I'd love to hear that. No, honestly, I'm not making that up. Because I think Duduk is one of the most awesome pieces. Because as you know, Jivan Gasparian worked on um, the, uh, the movie with... Gladiator. Thank you, Gladiator. That's the one. Thanks for that heckle. Thanks for that heckle. Uh, Gladiator. And, and do you know what? It was such a predominant part of that music that um, it, it blew my mind. Has anyone seen the movie? No, actually, you're still young, aren't you? Have you seen the Gladiator movie? Yeah. yeah it's good, great, isn't it? Yeah. 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 You, when you're a little bit older, you'll get to see it. It's awesome. And it, there's so much involved with that music. And it's part of that is the doodle. So, awesome, pal. Um, so, yeah, so I grew up. And then I started doing my grades. And I did my grades. I did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I was 15 years old. And when I did my grades, I finished my grades at 15. I was a, a concert pianist by the time I was 16. Um, and I toured uh, in a few places around the world doing concerts on the piano um, and doing, you know, um, basically repertoires. Um, but I was put into a lot of competitions, okay, as a young guy. So anyone here, 12? Who's here 12? 12, 13? 13? 13, okay, cool. Right, I was 13 years old when I entered the Dorothy Foster's Cup competition, which is basically a North London competition where all the children get together and do this um, concert. Now, to, with all due respect, my piano teacher was Philippine. Okay, and she wasn't very good in English either, and nor was my mum. I mean, my mum was living in this country. She still, she still lives in this country, and she still can't speak proper English. Karasu is and she's like, I, I, I know how to speak proper English, and all that business, you know. So, but I was, I, I, I went into a competition, and this is a true story. I went into a competition to uh, compete for the best pianist in the world. Okay, is that someone coming in late? No? Okay. Um, and I went in for the best competition, right? To be the best pianist. And I went in for the competition and all the competitors were either Japanese or Chinese. I was the only Armenian, right? And there was about, I think, 11 kids. And they were all ranging from the ages of 12 through to about 14. And we went in. Now, I want to tell you, part of my life learning to play the piano was the passion that I felt when playing it, just like, you know, with your doodle as well, the passion I felt playing it. And I really, I felt at home when I sat on the piano. For me, the music was a big part of my life, yeah? And I went in for this competition, and they said, uh, the first Chinese kid got up, and they said, please play your piece. And so this kid sat down, okay? And this kid sat down, and he had to play a piece of music or whatever. So he starts off, and he's very technical, whatever he does. Robotic as a gun. Then he plays another piece of music, which I thought was quite weird. Yeah? So he plays another piece of music and then he stands up and leaves. Then they said, please welcome, uh, sorry, please uh, can uh, Kev, Kev Kapikian, can you please come up to the stage? So I came up to the stage and they said, what are you going to play for us? And I said, I'm going to play Mozart Sonata in C. So I sat down and of course I'm very proud because I've practiced this for three months, right? This is all I've ever done. Okay? So I'm sat in the game. Everyone's listening to it, but I'm putting so much emotion into my um, my music, so I'm not giving it all. And I'm really going for it like that, right? And you could, and my mum was like, "Hey, child, what about?" As you can imagine, right? That, a typical Armenian mum. No one else speaks Armenian in the actual room, right? Maybe the last, the last. So I'm there. I'm giving it all, you know, the, the whole kind of shebang and everything. Anyway, I finished the piece and I went and I stood up and I, went, and I walked off, right? So I walked off after playing one piece of music. Now, the other Chinese ch child before me played two and I thought maybe because they were too short, you know, that. So I went and sat next to my mum and my mum went, yeah, bravo, love it, love, 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 love my kids, bravo, bravo. Right? So I said, thank you, mum. And the judges didn't call anyone else's name. So I thought, what's going on? Right? So we're all waiting like that. 
Are we waiting? Are we still waiting? And I'm thinking, what's going on? And one of the judges went, he had his back to me. He turned around and went, Excuse me, Kavork. <laughs> I said, Yes. He said, um, This is a competition, it's a repertoire. I said, Yes. He said, Two pieces. You have to play two pieces. Right? And I'd only practiced one for three months. Right? I'm not making this up. True story. And my mum looked at me and went, Ah, ha. Berchata, berchata. That is right. <laughs> so I was like, I'm a chimney on that, right? And I'm really not worried. So I went, okay, no problem. So my mum went, I went, oh, it's okay. So I got up, right? And I got up and I sat down. I was 12 or 13 years old at the time. And I sat down at the piano. And he said, will you be playing as a second piece of music? I said, yes. And he said, oh, okay. I said, sorry, I forgot the music at home. Super awesome. And uh, he went, oh, okay. He said, oh, well, please, please feel free to play. I said, okay. And just as I'm about to start, now imagine, I have no idea what I'm going to play, right? This is true story, I have no idea what I'm going to play, right? There was about 200 people watching, no idea what I'm going to play. I'm standing there, I'm looking at it going, Aswa Tsaili in the Okne. In the Okne, Aswa Tsaili, right? I'm looking at my mum, and my mum's like this. <laughs> right? She has no idea, no idea what's going on, honestly. We're... So I sat down, and I thought, Let's get cocky, let's get really like cocky, let's do something that's going to... And I swear to you, and if I, I'll, I'll remember some of it, I can't remember all of it, but I remember some of it. But I sat at the piano, and I just thought, I'm going to do something that's going to blow everyone away, right? Now this is part of what I think part of our Armenianism is, where we don't like to give up. Does anyone here give up? No? Good. Right, don't ever give up in life, ever. So I sat at the piano, right, and I thought, yeah, let's do this. And I went like, this is what I played, this is exactly what I played, right? I just made all that up because when you learn the piano, when you learn the musical instrument, you know where to go with the melody, right? So I kind of put about 500 different pieces that I'd learned together and made this piece of music up. And I bowed, and as I bowed, I stood there because you weren't allowed to move until they said. So I stood at that, and, um, and everyone stopped and they nodded, and I thought, thank you. So as I'm walking off, I'm literally going past the judges' table, and as I the judges, one of them turned around and went, oh, excuse me, Mr. Sarah, Kathy Kiani. I said, no, here we go, not in Pamela, right? I went, yes. She said, what? what's the piece called? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't, I didn't know. I, no. And I just went, firework. <laughs> and I went and sat back down, right? I sat back next to my mum, and my, <laughs> my mum went, I said, I'm actually not coming to the same group. <laughs> I said, I don't mean to like this just And I said, I just made it up. Anyway, we sat there. My mum just couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. I don't know where it came from, actually, by the way. Especially the bit where it went. I just thought, I just want to look emotional. Oh, sorry. So I did the whole thing, right? <laughs> and then they're doing the competition. And all these Japanese children are coming and going. And finishing off like that, you know, all these. Like, like, 
going mad with it all, whatever. And I'm just sitting there going, oh my God. And then one child got up. Uh, it was another Chinese child. He went, and he just looked at me as if to say, I'm going to win this. And I thought, okay, whatever. Yeah, and I kind of left it. You know, you know, you kind of get into school playgrounds and you have a fight. It was, it was one of those, but with fingers on the piano. So I was like, okay, well, let's see what we're going to do now. So anyway, everyone played, everyone finished. My mum's sitting there like this. And oh, my sister was with me as well. My sister, who's now a piano teacher, <laughs> right? So she's there as well, and we're all watching that. So my mum's watching. And he said, okay, and in third place, he said, um, it'll be Joshi Dan Chatwa, right? So I thought, fantastic. And whatever, and that was fantastic. In second place, he shone shine to you, right? So we're all like that, we're like fantastic, right? So this is great, this is great. And at that point, I swear to you, my mum went, Carl Daddy Norton. So she completely lost complete faith in me even winning this competition, right? Because it was all Chinese and Japanese children winning, right? She's like, come on, come Daddy, come Daddy. Right? So, and um, anyway, in first place, Kavulk Kapikyan, right? And I didn't think I'd won at that point because I believed my mum, right? So I'm, I'm sitting there going like this. And my mum went, I'm a touche, it's a touche. I went, yeah. So I got up, went and got the cup, uh, came back, and my mum went, how dare I'm in a McDonald's at them. Right? Because the thing was, right? You could only go to McDonald's, <laughs> you know where I'm coming from, right? Exactly. You could only go to McDonald's if you did something good, yeah? So I used to come because Kevin Tata in the school, he was here. So we used to leave school here on the side. And, um, and I used to have our mini school here on a Sunday. And we used to leave. And if I'd done a good job where one of the teachers, who are all now really good friends of mine, by the way, but one of the teachers, if they said, Kevo can love it, I No, no, love it. Tasani Mecha, love it. Right? If that was the case, then as we were going home, um, and you're two young guys to even remember the song, but there was a song, I mean, me and Miss Ak will probably remember, but the song was, um, the McDonald's theme tune was, To all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickled onions on a sesame seed bun. At McDonald's, we've got time for you. Right, and that was it, right? That was the song. So we'd be in the back of the car, right? We'd be in the back of the car, me and my sister like that. I'm 12, my sister's eight. Funny names, right? So I'll be there, and um, <laughs> that's where we'd be sitting there like that. And as we're getting closer to McDonald's in Turnpike Lane, I'd go, To all be very special sauce. No, my sister sang it. Apologies, apologies. My sister would go, To all be very special sauce, ladies, you. And I'd go, <laughs> and we sing it like that. And you can see my mum going, I saw Charlie, but I don't know what she got. Yeah, it was that kind of thing. And we had that all the time as I was growing up. But getting back to it, I grew up and um, I became a concert pianist. So I travelled all over the world doing my piano. And then and then I wanted to go into the performing arts. I wanted to be funny. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be someone who made people laugh, someone who entertained people, you know, someone who gets in front of the stage. So I went for my first audition, and this is God's honest truth. There was a musical. Anyone know the musical Me and My Girl? By any chance. Right. It's a very cockney English musical uh, about basically old time Britain, okay? And all the songs are any time your Lambeth way, any evening, any day, and all that kind of stuff. It's all those kind of songs. So um, I went for the audition, and I've never auditioned in my life. Hand on my heart, never auditioned in my life. And they, I looked it up in the stage newspaper, and it said, turn up, he said, um, we've got auditions, open auditions and blah, blah, blah. So I've turned up, and, I, and everything I say to you today, I swear to you from my heart, I'm trying to show you guys that the inspirational way that I did things is the way you should do things, and which is, go for it. Don't ever hold back. Don't let your fears hold you back. And what I mean by that is, don't let something crush you if you genuinely want to go out there and do it, yeah? If you want to go and succeed, it doesn't matter who tells you you're rubbish, you're crap, you're unable to do anything, yeah? You know in your mind that you can do it. Just like you did with the duduk, yeah? If someone had told you, no, that's rubbish, don't do it, would you have stopped? No. Great. That's exactly what the, the answer I was looking for. So, I went for an audition for me and my girl. And I turned up, and there was about four or five other people in there. And I could hear them sing, I could hear one by one the men going in and singing. And we had a script. And we had to go in there and sing it. And I walked in, and I said, hello, my name's Kev Orkian. I said, um, I'm 20, whatever years old, 22, 21, 21. I'm 21 years old, and um, I'm auditioning for the lead role. And he said, okay, Kev, uh, can you read us the script? Can you do the script? He said, no problem at all. 
So an actor came onto the stage and I had to do the acting with him. So I'm like, nah, don't do it like that, do it like this. I'll tell you what we've got to do. We've got to go out there and start singing. Yeah, of course you could. Oh, leaning on a lamppost at the corner of the street. And I was doing it like that. And just being cocky as I was, right? And then said, can you sing a song? So I sang the song, what they wanted, because I practiced it. And then the choreographer said, um, Ken, she said, do you dance? I said, yes, I do, I do, right? Yes, I do. And she said, oh, perfect. She said, uh, do you tap dance? And I thought, I thought, well, I'm not gonna fail. I'm not gonna fail. So I said, yes. <laughs> well, yes. Kita's, no, suck your thumb, right? Like you, like you. Right, a proper lion, lion, right? She said, oh, can you tap dance? I said, yes. She said, wonderful. I'm thinking, they're not gonna ask, I can go home for a week and I can get a proper, I can get proper training for if they give me the lead role, right? I can go and get proper training. She goes, wonderful, what size feet are you? And I thought, ah, ah, right? So she said, she said, there's some shoes over there. I thought, oh, okay. So I just went, just, just do it, yeah, just do it. So I took my trainers off, put the tap shoes on, and I'm not making this up. She comes up, right? She comes up, she goes, right. She goes, can you follow me? She goes, I just want to see how good you are. I said, I said okay. So she goes, here we go. Five, six, seven, eight. And I went, that was her, by the way. That was her, that wasn't me, right? I went. And she went. She went, can you take the shoes off, please? <laughs> so I turned and went, yeah, sure. So I took the shoes off, she went, put them back on. So I put my trainers back on, and she said, so you don't really tap dance, do you? And I went, uh, no, not really. I, but I'm a quick learner. That's, that's what I said. I remember saying, I'm a quick learner. And she went, right, thank you very much. She said, yeah, we'll let you know. And as soon as they say to you, we'll let you know, there's nothing, exactly, there's nothing. So I was like this. Uh, so I'm not doing that Get another McDonald's. Right, so I came home and that night at 8 o'clock, my mum and dad are sitting there watching Dinner Sleep. Uh, you won't know what that is, but the two at the back will probably laugh at that. Um, a phone call came and I picked up the phone. And I said, hello? He said, hi, is that Kev? I said, yeah, this is Kev. He said, hi, this is John Basham. I said, oh, hi, John. How are you? I said, uh, and he was the director. He was the guy that was auditioning me. So I said, hi John, how are you? He said, yeah. He said, Kev, um, I'm going to take a chance on you. I I'd like to give you the lead in London. I went, what? He said, I'd like to give you the lead. I said, but I can't tap dance. He said, no, but you can learn. You can learn very quickly. He said, okay, fine. So I got the lead, and I played um, the lead in Me and My Girl for four months in London. And I took over from Brian Connolly. So I was really excited about that because Brian Connolly was a big star. He's actually going now, he's going straight to EastEnders now. You'll see him in EastEnders in the next couple of months. So I was so overwhelmed by that. And I played the lead in London. I won quite a few awards. I won Best Actor, this, that, whatever. It was all great. And then you're back to square one again because the job's finished. Now you're unemployed. Now there's no money again. Now you're thinking, I'm a each billionaire. What do I do now? How do I earn money? Do I go for another show? Do you know what I'm saying? So what did I do? I went for another audition. This would have been my second audition. For a, for a show called Fame. Have you ever heard of that show? Some of you? Some of you have heard, some of you have. A show called Fame. And I went for the Puerto Rican character in the, in the, in the show. But I turned up. Now this is even worse than the first one about lying, yeah? Because I went to the audition, and I walked in, and I got my trainers on, I got my leg uh, leggings, um, tracksuit bottoms, I'm not gonna say leggings, but right, tracksuit bottom, and I got a t-shirt, okay? And I walked into a room where every man is about six foot two, right? I'm the only five foot six in there, right? Actually, I was five foot five, I've grown an inch. But I was five foot five, right? And I walked in, I've gone, oh my God. Right? And every one of them looks like a professional dancer. Six packs, chiseled, or some of them, well, quite a lot of them gay guys. Oh, I can't wait to do this. So I all that was, I'm thinking, oh, ah, he should be doing that, he should be doing that. But I walked in, and quite a lot of them were going like that, and stretching like this, and all this, and I'm thinking, I'm standing there going, I can't do this, I can't do this. Right? And then I thought, no, 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 you can, you can. Do it, do it. So the woman starts choreographing, and all the guys are like, bah, 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 bah. 
And this is me. I look like an idiot, right? I took 30 seconds, guys, 30 seconds, and something triggered in my head and went, you're not going to lose this, you're not going to lose this, go to the casting director. So I literally walked behind all the dancers, all of them there, you know, dancing away. And I went up to the casting director and I went, hello, and she went, hello. I said, my name's Kev Orkin. She went, nice to meet you, Kev. I said, I think I've come to the wrong part of the audition. And she said, why is that? I said, because I'm here for the acting part. Now, I didn't know if there was one. Well, I just made it up. And she said, oh, really? She said, what, what, what part are you thinking about? I said, the, uh, the pianist. Because I remember the movie having a pianist in it, right? So I thought, the pianist. And she went, oh, um, okay. She said, why don't you wait downstairs? She said, we'll call you up. I thought, right, okay. So I thought, I thought, I've got out of the dancing. Right, no more dancing. Okay, so I got out of that. I went downstairs, 30 minutes, I'm waiting there going, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? They're going to ask me to sing, I'll sing Billy Joel, I'll sing Elton John. Um, what am I going to, what joke am I going to do, whatever. Because I'm just thinking of ideas, right? And uh, 30 minutes later, all the guys that were dancing come down. They're all dripping, they're all like, oh, I did so well. Like, so I'm thinking, oh my God, oh my God. And they all came down and it was done with us. And then I heard my voice, Kev Orkin, can you come up please? Yeah, no worries. So I walked upstairs and I walked in. And I stood there like that and I said, hi. And they said, hi Kev, um, so who's your agent? Right, because immediately, right, they'd obviously realised that I'd been in the wrong category. And they were going to phone the agent to say, idiot, why don't you put him in the right category? And so I turned around. Now, I'm not making this up, right? I, could, I didn't have an agent. There was no, I didn't have an agent. So I'm thinking, each between them, each between them, right? Now, Kevork, listen to this, Kevork in Russian is Georg. And Georg in, in English is George. Right? And my original surname, before the genocide, 1915 genocide, on my father's side, was Gabriel Yank. Yeah? And then they changed it to Kapikya, or Kapik, which is old Turkish money. And then they, and then they put the Yan on the end of it, which made it Kapikya, right? And my mum always told me about, about Gabriel Yank, right? So the only thing that came into my head was, all right, let's do it. And I walked up and I went, uh, Adrian, oh, I said, that's George Gabriel. She went, sorry? I said, George Gabriel Associates. Oh, where are they based? I said, um, Hertfordshire. Okay, so I'm making it up as I'm going along, right? And she goes, oh, wonderful. She goes, can you give us their number? I said, yes. And I gave my home number. <laughs> but I was living on my own anyway. But, uh, I was living on my own. No, I was, I was living with my uh, fiancé at the time. And uh, I gave my home number. Anyway, I thought, I better get home quick, because if they call when my, when my fiancé is there, she'll be like, what are you talking about? Yeah, and I'm like, I thought, I better get home quick. So anyway, they said, look, we'll let you know. I went straight home. I said, did we have any phone calls? No, nothing, nothing, sir. Hallelujah, okay. So I went in, I said, don't answer any calls. She said, why? Such an idiot. Right? I said, no, don't, don't, right? So I got in, no phone calls that night. I thought, ah, oh, I'm Following morning, right? 9.30 in the morning, I get a phone. And I went, hello, George Gabriel Associates, how can I help you? And he went, okay, what? Her mum, Tunis. Okay, it was like, you know, <laughs> so, you know like, I thought, okay, I'll get away with that one. Right, so then it was about two or three calls, two or three calls. And then my mum, uh, my mum, uh, then they called, right? So I went, hello, George Gabriel Associates, how can I help you? Oh, hello, is that um, uh, George Gabriel? I said, yes, that's, this is George, how can I help you? Your, um, your client, Kev uh, turned up for uh, an audition yesterday for fame, but was in the wrong category. Yes, we did discuss that with him actually, and uh, we realised that we did put him in the wrong category on that particular uh, audition. Um, how can I help you? Oh, um, we'd like to offer Kev um, 12 months in the West End playing um, uh, Joe Vega in the uh, production of uh, Fame. And I went, oh wonderful, yes that would be great. Um, could you send me all the details through on an email? Yes we can. They sent the details through, I was earning like six, seven hundred pounds a, a week doing this thing. And I was like, oh my god, this is absolutely amazing. And I got the part. Now, I got the part, but then as soon as I got that part, that was my career made. Because what I'd done was I made people believe that I could do the job. I didn't need to audition again. I went from fame to Greece. You know, Greece, you must know Greece, the musical. Right. To Buddy Holly, the musical. To Happy Days, the musical. To Booby Nights, the musical. To me and uh, to uh, Annie, the musical. To a couple of other. Uh, Oklahoma, sorry. Fiddle on the Roof. I did quite a lot. So I did about 10 musicals in the West End, but I never auditioned again because they came and saw me in the show, they loved what they saw, and then I never auditioned again. So what happened was my career just went and that's when I wanted to change. Now how many people here love to tell a joke? 
Be honest. Great, great. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, darling. Do you like to tell a joke? Any others? Yeah? And when you tell a joke, how do you feel when people laugh? Tell me. Good? Yeah, any others? Who else was telling a joke? You, sweetheart. When, when you tell a joke and people laugh, how do you feel? Happy. Happy? Yeah, absolutely. How do you feel? Feels good. Feels good, doesn't it? Feels great. When I was in the musical and I was doing my jokes, people were laughing, laughing, laughing. But I wanted all that for myself. I became greedy. And I wanted it for myself. I, want, I wanted to prove to myself that I could get on stage and tell a joke. So I was in a musical called Happy Days, which Miss Up will know, you know, the old Fonz. And the Fonz, actually, was my director, Henry Winkler. Yeah. And there was a scene, and the scene was that I had to sit on a chair, on a sofa, next to Howard Cunningham, who played the father in the show. And I had to sit next to him. And he said to me, so Ralph, and I was playing Ralph Mouth, um, one of the comics. So Ralph, tell me, how have you been today? I said, oh, it's great, man. I said, I've learned three jokes, and I'd love to tell you. He said, oh, go on, tell me the jokes. And they were written specifically for the show. The first one was, uh, what do you call a fish with no eyes? Yeah, that was the first joke. What do you call a pig with three eyes? Pig. And the third joke was, what do, um, what do toilet seats and other anniversaries have in common? I don't know. What do toilet seats and anniversaries have in common? Men miss both. Right? That was the third one. Now, you probably won't get that. But anyway, so they were the three jokes, right? They were the three jokes. Every single night we did it, we got big laughs. Big laughs. But one night, the actor I was playing opposite said to me, Kev, why are you moving so much? Now I was beginning to learn what comedy was about. I was beginning to learn how to sell comedy. He said to me, don't move when you're telling the joke. What do you mean? Don't move. Every time you tell the joke, you're sitting on the chair and you're going, uh, what do you call a fish with, the, uh, what do you call a fish with no eyes? That's, and I'm still moving, I'm still doing all this, and blah, blah, blah. Like and they were laughing, he said, I guarantee you, do the three jokes. He said, and don't move. Okay, so what does that do? He said, you get bigger laughs. I said, okay. He said, look at me, and when I don't laugh at you, don't laugh back, and the jokes will get funnier and funnier. So one night, I'm sitting there, the first time I'm doing it with him, not moving, anyway. So, uh, what do you call a fish with no eyes? I don't know what do you call a fish with no eyes. And we just stared at each other like that. And the laughs got bigger and bigger, right? And it taught me a very big lesson. That actually, when you do comedy, it's not all about trying to get the laughs. It's actually about the, the tragedy behind the comedy as well. So I decided to go into stand-up comedy. And what did I do? I created an Armenian character that walks on stage. Has anyone seen the YouTube clips? Has anyone seen Britain's Got Talent? Did any of you watch that? So that character was developed from what I did after Happy Days. And the character comes out and he talks. So I walk on stage and I totally and utterly speak like my mum and dad. I thought that's funny. And it was funny actually because when my mum said to me uh, at the time, she said, Inch I said, I'm writing my comedy material. I said, I'm writing all about how you know, comedy, and she said, Okay, she said, but I'm not inch, 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 panelist. You see, actually, I'm going to do it about you. She said, two kids. And uh, so, and I did. I based my entire character on my mum, my mum and dad. Because my dad, even today, my dad, Anulinichi, for example, what's Anulinichi, mum? Lydia. Lydia, right. So this is my dad, right? Pretend my dad has known you, right, all your life, yeah? He will still look at you and go, uh, as, no, what you get? Uh, Silva, I can see. Tanya, uh, ah, get see what I mean. Ah, Lydia, Lydia, is it? Huh? Lydia, Lydia, right? And that's what he'll do. He'll 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 take hours trying to figure your name out, right? And and it just, I just thought that's funny. And sometimes he'll look at me and he'll go. <laughs> there. And he'll he'll have a go at me, and he's the one my, not saying my name. But, hey, and I'll go. Kevon, and he goes, Akidembo! Well, what did you say my name is? You know, it's that kind of thing. So you kind of get that kind of just with my dad. Whereas my mum, my mum is very much 
the language is very funny for my mom. You know, and, uh, and, and when she talks, everything's like this. This. Yeah? So it's like, um, you know, uh, hello, 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 how are you? <laughs> how are you? Okay, and then she wonders why she's got a sore throat. And then she's like, hello, how are you? And then she's like, um, and then she speaks in Armenian to English people, and they don't even know what she's talking about. <laughs> right? No, seriously, my mum will tell them, I'm like, go! And they'll be like, what? what? Yeah, my mom's like that, man. Just, but, but you know, it's that kind of thing. But they do it all the time. But even to this day, my mum and dad still believe they speak proper English. <laughs> they do. Seriously, God. One day, my mum, I'm not making this up. I brought a girlfriend home, and my mum always, my mum had a thing about my girlfriends. Okay, hi, mum, I am. Okay, had a thing about my girlfriend. Every time I brought a girlfriend home, my mum would go like this. My mum sounds like me. I see you over there. See your girlfriend, is See your bottle people, man. Right? It was like every time it was a different vegetable. I see a bottle people, man. I see a bottle of jelly, man. I saw my, I said, listen, man, listen, man. Kita, man, kita, man, bottle of jelly, bottle of jelly. Right? So, and she always used to insult my uh, my girlfriends all the time. And then one day she actually turned around, and my girlfriend came in, and my girlfriend went, oh hello, uh, Rosie. But Vartini is my mum's name, but everyone calls her Rose. Rosie, nice to meet you. And she went, oh, bottle. <laughs> The girl didn't even know. She went, I think your mum likes me. No, she don't, right? So there was that attitude in it when we grew up. So I decided to put that character onto the stage. So I walk on stage and go, hello, thank you very much. I come from Armenia. Uh, you know, uh, it's a very small country. So small, we put a mirror on one end so it looks bigger. You know? And I was doing those kind of, uh, those kind of jokes, right? And I do it all the time. It would be a little different jokes. Like, you know, in, in our country, by the way, I have to tell you, my country is very healthy. Very healthy country. So much so, we actually had to shoot somebody to start a graveyard. You know, I can say, this is how healthy we are. You know, and it was all that kind of stuff. You know, you, you created, and it was all very soft comedy. It was very long. But the character developed so much so that I had the privilege of literally working with predominantly every single big, big name comic in this country. Everyone from Michael McIntyre to Jason Manford to Lee Evans. I've worked with all of them. I've either supported them or I've worked with them in different shows. And all of them, every single one of them, does not know me before I do my act. So when they go, please now welcome, all the way from Armenia, Mr. Kev Orkin. And the music comes on, right? And I come and go, hello, hello, thank you so much. I come from Armenia, I come on the Euro Tunnel. You know this? I love it. I come on the Euro Tunnel. Uh, it's very comfortable, by the way, the Euro Tunnel. Very comfortable. It's very fast, like this, very windy, but no problem. I hold on top, very tight like this. And you kind of get into the comedy, so everyone now realizes you're kind of a, an illegal immigrant, you know, that kind of stuff. You're building your act, and um, you know, you're making it really funny. And I, and I come here, uh, I have a passport. I have a passport. Yes, I have a passport. It's a British passport. Yes, I have. Look, and I show them the, uh, the passport, and I go, look. It's a picture and everything, you know? It's not me, I have to change it, but uh, it's wonderful, you know? And then you start making it back, and it became better and better. And then, I started working for very big names, like Prince Charles, I did his charity event. And Prince Charles came up to me after the show, I'm not making this up. I never ever break my accent, I always talk with the accent. Thank you very much, I love you, I see you again soon, thank you, uh, uh, power to loving women. Uh, so I walk off. And as I walk off, uh, they said, can you wait here? Because uh, Prince Charles would like to come and shake your hand. I thought, okay, no problem. So I said, Billy Gellers, Kenty West Billy Gellers. So he goes around and he's shaking everyone. <laughs> and, um, and then he came up to me. And he then came up to me. And bear in mind, I haven't broken my accent. Hold on a bit. Accent of Panalazm, uh, Shorsalazm. Okay, so I, I talk like this all the time. And he's come up to me and he's literally gone. You were very good! <laughs> okay, and I'm thinking, Marta Chiki, they're going to Kriat Zien. Yeah? And Kriat Zien. Okay? So I'm thinking, oh, each one of Do I embarrass him now? Do I actually embarrass him? And I thought, yeah, why not? If I'm not going to do it, someone else will. Yes, I'm not there. I better get in there before someone else does. So I literally went like this. I stood there and I went, oh, thank you so much. I said, it's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. And he literally went like this. He literally went. <laughs> and he walked off. He walked off. Anyway, so I've, I've been lucky enough 
to actually perform for Prince Charles, Princess Anne, Prince Edward, Prince Andrew. Um, the uh, <laughs> gutted, gutted. Um, I've also performed for uh, Prince Philip, who died uh, recently, well, last week, wasn't it? He died, passed away. I did Prince Philip's 89th birthday, and um, it was very funny because I turned up to the venue, I put my piano out. Oh no, I didn't have a piano. They gave me a piano. Sorry, I had a grand piano on the stage. And I walked in, and as you walk in, you go, oh my god, he's there. Right? And he was sitting there, and he'd broken his hand. He'd actually, uh, I think he had a, no, not broken, he'd fractured his hand. So he was sitting at the table, and this hand was on the thing, but he had a, a kind of a very light plaster on his, um, on his arm. Like and he's watching, and this girl got up and she started singing, and everyone was like, ah, okay. And, and she did her bit, and then someone else did their bit, and whatever. And then they went, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a very small break, and then we're going to, which I hate, by the way, especially when everyone parked up, do you know what I mean? It's like in the middle of this right now, turn around and go, had a break, man, Nick, we'll come back in 10 minutes. Everyone's like, oh, oh, oh. you know, that kind of attitude. So I was like, oh, this is not going to work. Anyway, I literally went, oh, please, God, please, God, don't go home. Don't go home, because usually on breaks, the royal family leaves very quickly. They always have done, right? Uh, but I've been very blessed that every time I've done a show, they've always stayed. Even though they don't know me, they've always stayed. But on this particular occasion, I saw him as I walked in there, and I was saying, going, please, 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 please stay, please stay. And he went, <laughs> and he stood up, and I thought, because now I don't get to perform for the uh, Prince, I don't get to perform for royalty. I get to perform for his friends, but not royalty. So I thought, I'm gutted. And this woman, from nowhere, walked up to him and whispered in his ear. Right? And he went, and sat back down again. Right? So I thought, oh, no, he's staying. Right? So then they went, please welcome Ken Walking. So I walked on, hello, thank you very much. Uh, lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you very much. I just want to say, I come from Arminia. And then blah, 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 and I mentioned a few things. And then I mentioned the Eurostar, I did all that as well, that joke. And then I turned around and I thought, do it, Kev, do it. And you're not really meant to pick on royalty. You're not meant to, right? But I thought, he's going to think I'm an immigrant. And he doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't even think I'm from this country, right? So whatever I do, he's going to forgive me. So I turned around and I went, so ladies and gentlemen, I said, I just want to say a big thank you uh, to my uncle, Uncle Philip. Uh, I said, the wonderful man. I said, I live with him. Uh, in the bottom of his garden. I don't, I'm just making it up as a garden, in the bottom of his garden. Uh, very calm, like a house. You know, what do you call this? Uh, shed. Shed, no, not shed. Mine's called D O G. It's very small. Uh, uh, okay, so, and it made it into a doghouse, right? So he starts laughing. But as he laughed, on his first big laugh, his hand that was broken, he went, oh, I forgot! Oh, oh. And he made a sound because he'd obviously forgotten, but he hit the table to make a laugh. And as he did that, I went, ah, girl! You are, come on, please. Okay, so, then he starts laughing more, right? So I turned around and said, anyway, we are the wonderful because uh, for a few days now, he feels sorry for me, so we shared in the bed. Uh, fortunately, that's wonderful. We shared the bed. He sleeps his side with lots of cushion and the corgis, and then I sleep this side, and it's wonderful. And we play um, uh, in the morning, you know, the, uh, my uh, auntie, she came in. I didn't even say the queen, I swear, my auntie, she came in. And then we all count like this, and then we play kiss chase, it's wonderful. And I was just going, and I just made it up as I was going along, right? And Prince Philip is now turning red, he's laughing too hard, right? So he laughs, he has a really good laugh with it, everything's fantastic. And then uh, at the end, we finish. And he came up to me uh, at the end, and he said, I, I, I've never laughed as hard as that in my life. He said, I, I truly, truly have never laughed as hard as that. He said, I will definitely let Liz know. Liz, I thought, <laughs> Right, so I thought, yeah, no problem. So thank you very much. Shook his hand, and, and that was his birthday. Moving on swiftly, about ten years after, this was only about six, seven years ago. Uh, seven years ago, I'm in South Africa, and I'm raising money for orphans, for children who were much younger than you guys. Who's the youngest? Is, uh, it must be Sack said it was ten. Who's ten? Who's nine? Is anyone? Oh, you got nine. It was. Oh, okay. Who's yeah. two? They sneaked in, they... Okay, so in South Africa, I run an orphanage with my wife. My wife used to look after an orphanage. We now still look after it, but we finance, we, we finance this orphanage in, um, in South Africa. And all the children are under eight years old. All of them have either got HIV, AIDS, or they're addicted to cocaine or heroin. It's, it's just how it is out there. So we, we look after them. And we were raising money for this particular charity. 
and they said we're going. To, I said I'm doing a stand-up comedy show in South Africa. It's um, it's roughly around a thousand people a night. I'm doing 28 nights, and we've sold out. So we've got 28,000 people coming to see the show. Um, can one night? Can I raise some money for this orphanage? And they went, yeah, yeah, you do it. I said, get the buckets. So I've got the buckets. Everything's ready, right? And that night, they said, Ken, we're going to have to cancel the buckets. I said, why is that? Desmond Tutu is coming. Now, if you look up who Desmond Tutu is, he's the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who is one of the most phenomenal human beings I've ever met, right? He is like another Gandhi, you know, he's like that, like really famous, but he's such an awesome human being. And he came to see the show, and they prepped all the actors, so we've all gone into a room like this, right? And they've gone, right, everyone, listen, whatever happens, don't touch or speak to Desmond Tutu. Don't speak to him. We're like, okay, okay. He's like, don't touch him, don't speak to him. If he speaks to you, just say, um, you know, thank you, thank you, shake his hand. Um, don't go to kiss him unless he kisses you. It's like royalty, right? So I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. So anyway, the first comedian walks on stage. Good evening, good evening, thank you very much, blah, 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 does his act, does his act, finish, finish, finish. Second act comes out, does his act, finish. Third act comes out, does his act. Everyone back to back, right? There was eight acts and I was the headline act. I was the last act that was going on. So I thought, oh, and not one person, not one person had even mentioned Desmond Tutu, not one, right? They'd done their act, gone, right? So I walked on stage and, um, and I went, and this is God's honest truth, God's honest truth. In the orphanage, just to go back slightly, sorry guys, there is a guy that drives us to the orphanage and back, and he speaks Corsa. Now if you know what that is, it's a language, it's a South African language, which is very much but I'm not making that up. That's the kind of language they speak to. They go, uh, and I said to him once, can you give me the alphabet in, in Corsa? And he went, yeah. He's in the uh, And I was like, oh my God, right? And it was an amazing language, right? And I was like, oh my God. And that was the day before I get to meet Desmond Tutu, right? This is what I mean by, by thinking on your feet. Always do things, thinking on your feet. Just take chances in life. Take risks. Take risks. Don't be afraid of risk. Don't be afraid. People who take risks are more successful in life than people who don't, right? That's a categorical fact, right? So I've gone onto the stage on the last act. Please welcome Kev Walking. Dun, 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 fellow, 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 thank you very much. Done my act again. Done a few other di different jokes. And then I went, so I have been in uh, South Africa now uh, unintentionally for three years because I took the wrong ship. And I'm here. And I said, um, I said, and I know, I know it's the uh, Desmond Tutu. Now at that point, the guy who was producing the show went, I just did that because now I've mentioned Desmond Tutu. I said, me and Desmond Tutu, we are very good friends. Uh, and we went to um, Kruger the Park, didn't we? And I just did that. Now Desmond Tutu felt obliged to answer. He went, yes, yes, he, we went to Kruger Park together, yes. And so I thought, oh, it's working, right? So I tell him, I went, and we went to the crew of the back again, and um, we, we saw a lion. Now, this is a true story, but I embellished it with him. The true story is, I went to Kruger, I was in the National Park Kruger, and there was a guy who was probably, okay, if I'm here, the ping pong table, right? He was there, actually further, he was a little bit further than that. So, yeah, so basically, I just want you to get the image of what I'm talking about. But I was about here, and he was there. So you're talking quite a long distance, yeah? And he was a trekker. He was a guy, very, um, very thin, very tall, six foot four, trek, trekker. And he had a stick in his hand. And this is a true story, guys, I'm not making this up. And he would trek in front of us, and, and we were walking. I, I wasn't with Desmond Tutu at this point, by the way. I was with some other groups. And as we were walking, you can hear, you can hear the elephants in the back. You know, this is amazing. And you can hear that, and you can hear all the snakes and everything. And there are poisonous snakes there, and everything. Oh my god, oh my god. And then we saw quite a few big tarantula spiders like that, like big ones, like horrible actually. One looked like you had a Mohican and a tattoo. But the thing was, they were all like playing around, you know, going off in their bits and bottles. And as we're walking, as we're walking, the trekker goes like this in front of me. He goes, does that. Right? So I've got, right? I mean, I've got, I've got a little bit scared, right? So I'm like, oh my Jenna. So I'm just, I'm just looking, right? And, he, and he's there, he's, he's doing that. He's going like that, don't move. 
So I'm there, I'm not moving. I, I began to shiver, I'll be honest with you, because as he stopped us, he wasn't moving either. So I'm like, chill. And I'm looking around. And you know when you're like observing, trying to, you're thinking the worst now. You're thinking, how am I going? Right? And I'm looking and I'm going, am I around? And suddenly, if that's the distance with me and the trekker, the same distance, a female lion appears onto the path. Right? Okay, I'm like this. I'm like this. I need to go. <laughs> okay, I need to go. And I'm, I'm moving back. But in this sense, don't move. Don't move. But I moved. I had to move a little bit, butter. Right? So I'm like this. And as I'm going back, as I'm going back, like this, right? I, I must have taken about two or three steps. And I stopped, right? And I swear to you, Aswatsvaka, Suchakosu. The lion did this. Now, imagine the trekker, the trekker guy is in front, right? I would be directly behind the trekker guy, right? And the lion is directly in front of the trekker. And she does this. She's right in front of him. She can't even see me, right? She's seeing him, she can't see me. And she goes like this. I'm not, I'm not making this up. She goes, <laughs> and looks at me. Looks at me, dude. And I went, yeah, mate, yeah. <laughs> I actually did that. I went, yeah, mate. I said, I'm talking to a lion I've never met, right? <laughs> at the same time, I'm praying to God, going, Asmatei, Asdan, Yegan, Hajis, Kichimana, and he's just trying to do it. Each head government was ever on there. McDonald's was ever on there. And she's like, and I'm like, oh my God. Like, and the lion literally goes, <laughs> looks at me. And then just goes like, I'm not making this up, goes and starts walking towards me. So I'm thinking, Amen. Oh, like, yes, Gawal Temple, Gawal Temple. I'm, I'm praying, like, my life's gone, my life's gone, dude, right? So I'm praying. So he does this, and I'm not making this up, this was the funniest thing I ever experienced. The lion's doing that, walking, but okay, it's not a good impression, shut up, right? So, like, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, and as he gets closer to the man, right, the trekker, I've still, still got a chance to run, right? I'm not going to get anywhere because there's, there's nothing behind me. The, 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 the jeeps have gone, right? I can't even run into a jeep, right? The jeeps are gone. So, trekking. And as it's trekking towards the man, the man does this. The man does this. This is all I heard. Pretend I'm the man, right? He goes like this. He goes, No, Samantha! No! <laughs> right? <laughs> you know when you're going through some delusion in your head that you're going to die. But you know him, right? And then I'm thinking, Pants, <coughs> I heard the name Samantha. <coughs> and looking. So I thought, I've just heard the name Samantha, right? And the lion does this. <laughs> and goes off into the, into the big trees and things. And I went, Samantha, right? So, anyway, so the man comes towards me and he goes, don't worry, hey, hey, I tell you now, the lion isn't, oh yeah, it's a good one. And I understood nothing. I mean, I understood more from the lion, I'll be honest with you. He was just looking at me, going like that. I, I knew what he was thinking, but this man, I couldn't even make it out. So I turned around and I thought, oh, okay. So he said to me, basically, they know most of the lions, and the, well, all, actually, all the lions, are, and they know how they treat them. So they, they call them names, and basically, once they recognize the man, they don't really attack. They don't really. So I was like, okay. So I used that story on stage in South Africa. And I walked up and I went, so I went to Kruger the Park with Desmond the Tutu. Uh, he's a very big family, Desmond. And I'm making this up as I go along. I went, Desmond Tutu, he's a wonderful man. He's a very big family. Now at that point, he's got his daughter there and his wife. And I went, very big family. I said, there's Desmond Tutu, his brother Raymond Three Three, and uh, George Forfour. I said, George Forfour. And I said, and his sister, 1111, she's a lovely lady. I said, and I'm just doing that, I'm doing the jokes, right? He laughed so hard, right? He laughed so hard at that, that he literally just was up and down like this, right? Up and down like this. And then I said, and then I went, I just thought, I'm doing this. And then I went, but Desmond Tutu, he teach me a traditional African love song. And, under, and because the night before, the day before, I was in the taxi with that uh, taxi driver speaking Corsa, I thought I could do this, it'd be funny. So I turned around and I saw it, and uh, he teach me a love song, he said, Ken, if you ever go anywhere in the world, sing this song. 
and the woman she will fall in love with you. <laughs> so, so tonight I'm going to sing that song for you. And I pointed to this woman, and I said, "What is your name?" And she went, "Denisha." <laughs> and I went, and I went, "Bless you." What is your name? And she went, "Denisha." I said, "How much? How many times are you going to sneeze?" I said, "So she went, Denisha, Denisha." So I said, "Oh, Denisha, that's your name." Okay. And then one night, I also picked on a woman, because you know that in Africa they call their children, like, delicious. They call their children delicious. <laughs> Imagine, baby, people, oh, let's call this one delicious. <laughs> right? So this particular woman was called Echo. I'm not making this up. She goes, what's your name? I said, sorry, I said, what is your name, please? And she went, Echo. I went, Echo, Echo. <laughs> and so she didn't find it funny. So she said, Denisha. I said, okay, Denisha, I'm going to sing you a love song. I've done, I've done 134, 124 countries so far. Um, and every country, and I'm one of the only comedians in the world, I believe, that has done more countries speaking and doing the comedy and people understanding me with the comedy because every country has illegal immigrants. So my act works really well. But, um, but I took risks. And then, cruises. You know what cruise you can write yet? I've done 400 plus, actually, now I think. I've, done, I've, got, I've got another three this year, uh, which is just going around England coming back because you're not allowed to go anywhere else. But um, I've been on ships. I've been on ships where, you know, the, the actual ship itself has, um, has basically, if this is the ship, and uh, what a poor, poor example, this is the fun. And the ship's going, and then suddenly you're going through Bay of Escape, which is near uh, France, and, whatever, and the ship starts doing this. Right? And you're on the ship, you're absolutely on the ship, and you're, and you're going, you're going, oh, oh, because of, and it's going down, it's like, oh. and the moon, because the moon's opposite, and it's going up, up, and down, up, and down, and this is all like this. And I remember the alarm went off, and they said, crew, please make yourself available in the, in the uh, restaurant. So we went, we all sat in there, my, one of my first cruises as well, and I'm standing there going, what do I do? I've got the, I've got the, the life jacket on. I'm saying they said, right, everyone to your stations, we've got a very big um, wave coming, a very big one, and it could, uh, it could hurt us. He said, and that was the captain saying, he said, it could hurt us, so we need to get everyone into position now. The passengers will, will have to be looked after. We've sent everyone to their rooms. The alarm will be going off in two minutes. The alarm went off. The, uh, the wave was hitting us uh, within 45 minutes. So we're on the ship, 
and the alarm went off, and it's six, I don't know if you know this, it's seven, seven, six short blasts, one long blast, it means there's a, an emergency. So, and all that, and then the last one, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, this is the captain speaking. Can you please make your way back to your cabins as soon as possible? Please put your life jackets on and sit in your cabins. Make sure that your covers are all locked, that any loose items in your um, cabins are stored away. We have a wave coming and we want to make sure that we don't, we have no one that hurts and, uh, gets hurt on this particular cruise. So if you fall over and everything, we will um, have uh, lifeguards and, uh, and crew there available to help you. So I'm thinking this must be serious, right? I mean, it, it got really, really bad. So, picture the scene. This is one of my first ever cruises. We're on the ship like this, and I'm at the top deck. I'm here. This is where the restaurant was. And I thought, I'm not going back to my cabin. I'm staying here. So I stayed there, and I thought, just for them. Right? <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you're going to die, you might as well eat, die eating. Do you know what I mean? So I'm thinking, and there was loads of burgers and chips and whatever. So, yes, we'll do it. Yes, we'll do it. I'm not going to do it. And there's me. So, so, and I'm thinking, if I eat a bit more, it might help the stomach as well, right? So it's going, and the wave's coming here. So it's not hitting this way, it's hitting this way, right? So they turn the ship as much as they can, but you can't really go into a wave because it, it would back, back like that, and, and the wave was, um, they, they said it was around 50 something feet, it was massive, right? So I'm like, oi, okay. So it's going like this, it's coming this way, right? It's going, and we can see it. Now the scary thing is, I can actually see the wave, and I'm going, I'm out, I'm out. And it's like, oh my god, right? But I didn't have time to react. Because it came so quick, and it wasn't 45 minutes either, it was actually 32. 32 minutes later, it hits us, right? Hits one side of the ship. Right, now don't forget the ship's doing this, and then hits like that. As it hit, <laughs> so now the ship's hit, right? I float, right? I float to the other side, right? And I'm now, and honestly guys, I'm not making this up, this is not for a, in fact, this is the truth. I'm now, my face is against the window, right? But obviously they're thick windows, so you don't have to worry about dying, but it's like that. And I'm stuck on it, and the ship's going like this. And it's still going. And I'm thinking, Medak, right? Medak, Medak, it's that, it, at least I am, but Medak, right? And it got to there. So, I'm now looking at that, and it's quite dark, but I can see the splashes, right? And the splashes are not that far, but I'm going, whoo! Because <laughs> I've seen it on the side of the adventure, I've seen the movie, right? So I know if anything happens, I'll have to head that way, yeah? So I'm like, ah! Oh. And then the ship went, and then it came back again, right? So it came back to normality, right? And then it carried on doing that again. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, that was one of the most frightening experiences of my life. And when I told my mum, she said, Chu 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 chu, chu bi right? And uh, I went, chu bi ertang go, ertang go. Ah, tu nzi na ma tenin zi mer tu ne lu hamash. Right, so I did that. But then I, you know, I did all that. And then finally, uh, I think I've been talking for hours. So finally, I'm just going to finish off by saying, because I want some Q and A's. Finally, I did Armenia Uncovered. Did anyone see the movie? I know you did. Did anyone else see the movie? You've seen it as well? It's on Amazon Prime. It's on Amazon Prime. Check it out, guys. It's all about our country. It's not, now, it's not only now become a, um, a documentary, it's now become a historic documentary. So it's actually going into the archive documentary as well, because a lot of those places that we filmed are no longer uh, with us anymore, as you can imagine. So check out the documentary, Armenia Uncovered. But on that documentary, I played a piece of music. I wrote a piece of music. Now you can download the track. Uh, does everyone have, here have or know how to use Instagram? Give us a hands up, just give us a hands up. Cheers guys, all right. So on Instagram, if you go to my Instagram profile, Kev Orkian, yeah, you will see that I've got a link tree, um, uh, what do you call it, a link tree URL. Click on that and it will come up with the documentary, it will come up with the chat. And one of the things I've got on there is my track. Uh, and I wrote this piece of music and I, my dreams came true. And I'm gonna kind of share it with you. I actually got a, to have a white piano in Chorvira. You know the church? Right? And Chorvira, it's got a nice hill. And I played on top of that hill overlooking Mount Ararat. And I, and I wrote a piece of music called um, The March. And I'd like to play that piece of music. Would that be okay? Yeah? And the piece of music is called The March. And that is now available on Spotify, Apple Music, uh, you can download it. And if you buy it, I think it's only like 79p. And if you buy it, all the money that we're raising goes to the Armenia Fund to help um, kids your age uh, go through education. 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Anyway, so this is the piece I wrote. It's called The March. When she was 13 years old, she found a passion from the Armenian church that they used to go to every Sunday, found a passion of, there was a, like a, a, an organ, and she really wanted to learn. And her father said to her, uh, you're not allowed to learn because you're a woman, and you, you have to learn to cook, clean, and look after your family. So she was denied all aspects of being creative. So when, she, when then I was born, she basically influenced my life, and she's living, she was living her dream through me. That's basically what it was. So her encouragement was not only very harsh, but it was actually very disciplined. I mean, I got beaten at the piano on many occasions. I'm not making that up. I got beaten to a pulp. I mean, to, sometimes she would hurt me so hard that I couldn't even play the piano properly. But it was her anger and passion for wanting me never to give it up. And I don't blame my mum for what she did. My piano teacher, I, I, if you go to my blog, I think you did, didn't you, when I told you about that. On my blog, if you go to kevlive.com, that's my website, you'll see it from Instagram anyway. All my Click on that link, the link tree. Click on it. Everything's there. You can go to every single thing that I have on my uh, on my social media. If you go to it, you'll see a story on blog that I wrote about this week called um, uh, the, I think it was called the fingers. Uh, my piano fingers. I think it's called something like that. And my piano teacher actually turned around to me once when I was playing a piece. I can't remember. But let's just say sonata in C, and I went and I played the wrong note. And as I did. The entire lip came down on my fingers from a Steinway piano, and I couldn't play the piano for two weeks. I had blue across my, both my fingers like that. And when I went home, I told my mum, because I walked home. I, I was 15 at the time, 14, 15. And I walked home, and I showed my mum, and I went, nay, 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 touch that, it's a tree, inch of And she said, so there was no remorse from my mum. My mum wasn't going to make me give up the piano. There was no way she was going to make me uh, give up the piano. And I didn't. And I'm glad I did. So to answer to your question, 
I'm glad she was hard because I've spent my entire life sharing my music and comedy with the world, and, and it's and it's due to my mum. So great question. Anyone else? Any other questions? Yes, my brother. Um, has, there, has there ever been a time where um, you mentioned that you went to the auditions and you, you sort of lied your way? Has there ever been a time where it's not worked? In an audition? Yeah. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, so I went for an audition for um, EastEnders. Yeah, so when it was originally coming out, and actually two of us, uh, two Armenians went for EastEnders, Kerob Malikan as well. Um, he, if you look him up, he's actually an awesome actor, Hollywood actor, um, done great movies. And I, yeah, this, so this would have been in 1995. Uh, the, the EastEnders had been running for some time, a couple of years, and they wanted a new family to come in. They were, they were looking for a Greek, Greek Cypriot family to come in. So I went for the audition and I walked in, and I'm not making this up, I walked in, I oh, jeans and a t-shirt, whatever you know, uh, and as I walked in there was a black lady auditioning me. And as I walked in, she said, wait, no, I'm just playing it like that. And we were doing it and it was really awesome. And I stood up and I felt really proud for doing it because I did that high note, you know, you know the one they hit me goes, I mean I don't think I can do it today because I haven't practiced, but And they auditioned all day. I had to come back four times. And on the fourth time, I stood there, and uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber himself turned around and thanking him. He said, I truly uh, appreciate the, uh, the audition. He said, We are going to go with um, uh, the other actor on this occasion. He said, No, no problem at all. He said, Thank you so much for the opportunity. I said, Can I ask, if you don't mind me asking, why did you not choose me? He said, Because you're too short. <laughs> and that was the truth. Any other questions? Go for it, young man. Ted, that's what I can understand what you say, Mary Nelson. How does it like when you're coming into the world? You mean, how does it feel? Amazing. I go on aeroplanes, I go and see different cultures, different traditions, different people every single day of my life. Uh, in one, I remember one week, this was a very, very unique circumstance. In one week, I did, uh, this is a true story, this, on Wednesday, I flew out on Monday, on Wednesday, I was in Dubai performing for the uh, uh, sh um, uh, Sheikh Maktoum, the king of uh, Dubai. On the Thursday, I flew back to London, and I got to London, and I went up to Manchester, and I did a comedy club. So, for King Maktoum, it was um, four and a half thousand people I performed to. I then came back to England and performed for 70 people in the comedy club on the Thursday. On the Friday, I did a corporate show uh, for Prince, um, and, uh, Prince Edward sorry, in London at the Grover House Hotel for 500 people. And then on the Saturday, I performed for 21,000 people at the um, O2 Arena. And that was one week. And on the Sunday, I cried most of the day because I was jet lagged and I felt really, really terrible. But I did it. And what I'm saying is keep going for it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Travel all over the world, travel, see other cultures because you'll respect them and then you'll respect yourself more because you'll realise actually that we're all human beings and the ultimate religion on this planet is human beings. That is the ultimate religion. Forget everything else, forget Christianity, Muslim, Sikh, Buddhist, forget it all. If you see someone hurt, and I've seen plenty of people, I've gone to Japan and I've seen people there and I've met people, and I, don't even, I don't even know them. They go, what do you ask me? They go, oh, yeah. And I go, yes, I you? And I speak in Armenian and they go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And I say, and then you go to South Africa and you meet people. I love South Africa. I'm actually buying a house in South Africa. That's how much I love South Africa. I'm actually buying a house. I'm buying a house. I want to buy a house in Armenia if, if I can get the opportunity next year. I'm going to go out there and I want to invest some money into Armenia. I'm connecting with Armenia, which is what I wanted to say, by the way, guys. I have connected with Armenia and I'm reaching out to kids like yourselves, right? Children, students, adult students, musicians, you know, uh, artists. Violinists, and I'm reaching out to these kids. They don't have the same opportunity we do. So I run a platform called the British Pantomime Academy. Uh, if you look it up, you'll see what I'm talking about. The British Pantomime Academy is an academy that brings 
You know, you, all of you know what pantomime is, right? Right, it's the oldest tradition in the UK. I have done 28 pantomimes in this country, and I've worked with every celebrity on the planet in these pantomimes, and I, I love it, I adore it. But the fact remains, uh, there's children in Armenia that don't get the chances we do. So what I've done is I've connected with them. So we are now trying to teach students in Armenia all about pantomime and musical theatre. So we do online classes. And what I was going to say was, if you guys uh, are interested, we do online classes, literally, I think there's about eight of them every month. Um, and the online classes, that we, and then we do one-to-ones, and then we do uh, call workshops and blah, blah, blah. But we also have celebrities. And this month's celebrity, um, you probably a little bit too um, uh, past your time, but uh, there's a boy band called um, Blue. Um, and one of the singers in that is a pantomime star, so he's coming on to do a masterclass. I think that's next Tuesday, next Wednesday. So he's doing that. But just check it out, British Pantomime Academy. If you guys are really interested in theatre, in performing arts, connect. Connect with me. Just say, Kev, I was at the um, I Show, blah, 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 I'd love to connect. Let's get you on these platforms. Let's reach out to kids like you, who might then end up taking this further and making it even more amazing. Do you know what I mean? So I just wanted to say that. So that was just one of the things we were doing. Um, are we going to? Are you going to tell them about the pantomime? Well, what are you So um, next month, um, and if we don't go into any kind of stupid lockdown again, next month we're going to be bringing a production, a 60-minute production, pantomime production, uh, called Aladdin, and uh, it's my company. We produce the pantomime for schools. Um, so it's. It's an awesome production, it's very funny. It's obviously not a theatre production like you would go to a big London Palladium, but it's a really awesome show, and we do that, and we, we go around to all the schools, and we, um, we put on the production, and everyone enjoys it. We have interaction with the kids, and you have to be more interactive as well than that one particularly. But um, that's one of the things we do. Yes, darling? How much money do you earn a year? I earn, I earn enough money. I'm just going to interview, by the way. I, that's fine, this one. I earn, enough money to be able to give back tons of it to children and orphans, or orphans and to um, children with cancer, which I raise a lot of money for. And um, two years ago, I raised 1.8 million on my own for children with cancer and looking. But, but I'm not giving it to you. Let me just make that clear. I'm no different to you. Yes, you are you. You are you. You are you. You are you. you, are you. you, are you. I'm no different to you. The, the only thing that I've done is I've taught myself from a very young age. Doesn't matter. Take risks. There's no such thing as fear. Fear is something that we've actually made up, by the way. Fear is something we've made up. If you walk around, there are, and you see on, the, on videos or whatever, you see guys walking with lions and playing with tigers and this and that, whatever. They're wild. But if you don't have the fear, they won't, they won't hurt you. If we have fear, we'll stop ourselves doing a lot of stuff. Yeah? If you really want to do something in your life, really want to do it, don't speak to anyone else. Tell your mum and dad. But don't speak to your friends because they've all put their fear on you. Oh, you can't do that. That won't happen. It happened to me many times. I, t I kept telling my friends, oh, by the way, I want to do this. You don't want to do that, mate. You don't want to do that. That'll, that. Imagine if you didn't make any money. What's going to happen to your family? Oh, yeah, you're probably right. My wife does it. My wife does it now. Yeah, but Kev, if we do that, I mean, how much money are we going to lose? What's it to you? We'll make it back up. I'll work, I'll work again. It doesn't matter. Don't fear anything in your lives. Don't fear it. The moment you fear it is the moment you've lost. Yeah? Don't fear anything in your lives. Go for it, take risks, and be the best you can be. Because ultimately, ultimately, you were born amazing. You were born amazing. So just remember that. I'm going to take a couple more questions before we finish. Yeah, come on, come, come, couple more before we finish. Go for it, my brother. Have you done any tours of like stand-up comedies in higher side? Yes, I did. So does it feel the same when you like put on the same accent? And no, I don't do the accent. I don't, and I, 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 and I actually speak in Armenian fully then because they don't obviously understand English. But there was a couple of things. There's a joke, right? Good, good question, right? There's a joke in England where you look at a man with bald head, right? And you go to him, look at that man, he spent all day doing his hair and then he came out without it, right? The gag is basically, he's obviously wigged it and he's forgot to put his wig on his head, right? I did a version of that in Armenia, right? And I said, Asmatan Nay Mazadulatsukit, right? And I did this, and all the Armenians were like this. 
And I thought, oh my god, right? And then at one point, the cameraman was looking at me, and he walked on stage, and he was filming me here as I'm playing. And as I turned around, I went, I'm in Guinness School! Thanks, sir. And I did it as a joke, because obviously being comedy, the, and all the armies were like, As Martin Schneebus. And they all started getting angry with this man, <laughs> thinking I was upset. So they don't get what we do, and you can't do jokes like, don't bother doing girlfriend jokes. I mean, uh, you know, yes, your mom sometimes a guinea head girl, people go, Oh, I'm up! Yeah, it's that kind of thing. Yeah, it's that. They don't get it. They don't get the humour in that sense. So you have to be very kind. You have to be very different. So I tell them, and the jokes I would do is like this. Mets my inch, mess love is. I grand there, come out, you know them. So I do that, and it makes people laugh. Yeah, so that's the kind of humour. So yeah, I have toured in Armenia. Uh, I've toured yeah, all over. And I'm going on a national tour again in uh, 2022, um, doing my Armenia show. I'm actually planning on doing the one here in this country. I haven't done one for 16 years in this country. So I might do a stand up comedy show in this country. You do the job you Oh, you want you mean the uh, the the comedy one? Yeah. Right, so on Britain's Got Talent. I said I um, I learnt Elton John's I'm Still Standing, the CD version, right? I said, but the CD was really scratched, right? And uh, and I copied it exactly, and this is what came out. This is a very special talk because all of you are Armenian and Menk and Danny King. But, um, but I do all, all kinds of different other talks and whatever, and I do all uh, subjects, and, and, and I also do one on one mentoring. So, you know, I do things like if, if you really want to kind of do something and you're really excited about it, um, I've got a free one to one mentoring for 30 minutes on the website. You just go, just click on the free mentoring and tell me what you want to do. I'll encourage you, I'll help you, and I'll support you all the way. That's what it's all about. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you.